Hi, this is lesson five of an eight lesson course in the introduction to Frederick Nietzsche. I hope you enjoyed the last lesson, which was uh, Tony Warren's talking around the Sylvester Stallone story, the story of Rocky. And um, I hope that you took that as an opportunity to really ask, in what sense is that exactly what Frederick Nietzsche is talking about? In what sense is Rocky the Ubermarsch? In what sense has he discovered himself? And, and where is it also different? Um, and it's a very interesting debate, and really this is the, the main, main part of what you've got to tackle when you're reading Frederick Nietzsche. I now want to put Nietzsche and Nietzsche's philosophy in a bigger historical context. Look at how the world might have changed because of Nietzsche's philosophy. To, to, to one extent there's an argument that, um, that no philosopher can really sort of change opinion and that he just sort of rides a wave of social change that was happening anyway. And that's a perfectly valid argument, but, but not the question I think which is most important, which is to say, before Nietzsche, there is uh, the philosophical movement which is often called modernism. And certainly in Western Europe, in Western philosophy, it's defined by a strong, shared view of what is right and what is wrong. And from an ethical standpoint in Western Europe, that's very much a sort of Christian narrative. What, uh, what was later to be called a meta-narrative. Everyone kind of viewed that had, had largely the same definition of right or wrong. And indeed, if you didn't have the same definition of right or wrong, then the state would come and tell you you were wrong. And you know, most iconically, the sort of Spanish Inquisition, um, uh, a bit before Nietzsche. But, but more than that, the, there was a single definition of right and a single definition of wrong. And that was held by the vast majority of people in, the, in, in Western Europe. So, but after Nietzsche, you get this sense that actually there is what was often called the movement of postmodernism. So you get modernism, and you get Nietzsche, and you get postmodernism. And Nietzsche dies in 1900. And in the 20th century, you have this postmodern condition. And this postmodern condition is not the clear black and white of right and wrong, but it's sort of different shades of grey, like a sort of grey, sludgy porridge of, of sort of you know, ethical ambiguity. Um, what is right, what is wrong. It, it, for some people, the very meaning of right or wrong seems to go, as uh, in some parts of Nietzsche he seems to agree with that, that there's just no right or wrong. But for other people, there's still a clear definition of right or wrong, but what's interesting and, 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 to my mind, undeniable about that postmodern era is that it's no longer a shared view of what's right or wrong. Yes, they're still Christians, but by no means are they the single or even necessarily the largest um, group. There are other religions, there are people of no religion. And it seems that there's a change that people no longer sort of say, well, I'm a Christian, therefore whatever Christian believes is right and wrong, I will hold those views myself. They seem to do something else. They seem to say, well, what do I believe are right and wrong? And then what group, what philosophy, what religion best reflects what I have internalized as right or wrong? And so they're, they're going by a different route. And I think that's important. And that postmodern condition is uh, a very interesting and, and really actually relative quite a, quite a quick phenomena. And people like Nietzsche are very much seen as heralds and in, as sort of the midwife to this postmodern age. And I think that's important to put him in that context as we look again at his philosophy and try and understand it. I, um, I also, the, the very next lesson is a very short uh, clip from a stand up piece by Ricky Gervais, he's a very funny uh, British comedian. And I put this in because he's actually talking about Nietzsche, which, yeah, I give you, is not a, a common topic of, uh, of stand-up comedy. But uh, he does it quite well. He hits on um, something which is a common view of, of, of Frederick Nietzsche, that he inspired Hitler, and that he was somehow the philosophical grandfather of, of 
the sort of um, uh, national socialist movement, the Nazi party that happened in Germany. And there is probably a little truth to that, and probably also a bit of a lie. But it's interesting again to, to see Friedrich Nietzsche in this historical context and say to ourselves, well, to what extent does he cause or sort of herald this, uh, this, this, these political movements which happened in the 20th century? And they really do. I mean, communism and fascism are really things that, that sort of rise very strongly and, and find big uh, political support in the first half of the 20th century. Um, especially fascism uh, and in, in Western Europe and probably communism in, um, uh, in, in Eastern Europe, most famously. So, to what extent is he, does Nietzsche actually herald this fascist movement? To what extent is the, the Ubermarsch Hitler's definition of the Aryan race? And I think that's a very interesting question, and we'll come back to that in the very final. Uh, uh, final lesson of this uh, this eight, eight uh, lesson course. The penultimate lesson, the lesson before that, uh, and after the Ricky Gervais lesson, is um, a, a 40 minutes documentary by the BBC, very, very good one, on the life of Frederick Nietzsche. And it again touches on you know, some of how he, how he lived and, and, and uh, about his philosophy. And it again seems to sort of you know, put Nietzsche in this position. And again, it, it talk a little bit more about his views of the Ubermarsch and they touch on his influence in the 20th century. So have a look at the next two lessons, I hope you enjoy them, and be thinking about that, be thinking about in what sense is Friedrich Nietzsche herald in the 20th century and in what sense is he not? And what specific part, was it the uncertainty of the postmodern movement or the certainty of fascist and communist rule. It's an interesting debate. So enjoy the lessons. Thanks a lot. Good luck.